Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, welcome to my Earth Live lesson. It's called Miracles of Migration. And my name is Jamie Wyver. I've been involved in conservation for several years now, working for different nature and uh, environment charities. And I've had a keen interest in birds since when I was very, very young. And I remember being a member of the Young Ornithologists Club, which is a junior branch of the RSPB back in the 1980s. I'm here to tell you about something that I think is really, really special. And I'd like you, depending on where you're sitting watching this, to take a minute and have a look out of the window. If you're near a window, have a look up at the sky, see what you can see. Do come back, obviously. Um, and I want you to think about uh, the sky, not just as something we look up at and we see clouds and stars and if we're lucky, some birds, but a bird superhighway. We live in, in the UK in the middle of a bird superhighway. I'm going to show you this on the map behind me. So it stretches all the way across from Canada, let me get my pointer in the right place, all the way across to through Europe, through the UK there, over to Russia, and then down, down the middle, all the way down through Africa to the tip of South Africa. And this is called the East Atlantic Flyway. And as I said, it's a bird superhighway. It's where birds travel. Now, of course, they don't fly the whole flyway. That would be uh, an incredibly uh, long journey. They might want to make a journey from somewhere like, uh, let me get to the right place, Iceland down to the UK, or perhaps from um, the UK down to North Africa. It's a bit like us using the part of the motorway that we want to use to get from A to B. Some of them even go down little roads of their own. I'll talk about those a little bit later. Now, right now, we're in April, around 50 different types of birds have arrived or will be about to arrive in our skies, on our coasts, in our countryside. And it's an incredible journey. A lot of them will have spent the, the winter in Africa, some in Southern Europe. And that 50 birds, those 50 birds, that makes up around a quarter of all the birds that will nest with us here in the UK this summer. And the birds that spent the winter here will be in turn moving back, back up north. I'm gonna talk about a few of those as well today. But in particular, I'm gonna talk about 10 birds that are incredible creatures that do the most fascinating journeys and have the most inter interesting behavior. I'm gonna start with one that has probably the longest journey of all. Now this is the Arctic Tern. This is roughly, roughly life size. And as you can see, it's a little bit like a gull, a little bit like a gull, but um, a lot more streamlined, sort of pointy head, long pointy tail. And actually terns have a, a forked tail that looks a little bit that, like that of a swallow. And the Arctic tern actually has the nickname sea swallow. And what's so interesting about the Arctic tern is that it has probably the longest migration journey of any bird, or any animal on the planet. It's the ultimate long distance migrant. It spends the summer here or further north, perhaps. And it is slightly beyond the end of the East Atlantic flow, I suppose. But then in winter, it will fly down through Europe, through Africa, right down to Antarctica. Again, going right over the edge of the flyway that I mentioned earlier. And that round trip each year can take Arctic turns over 35,000 kilometers or 22,000 miles, which is an incredible journey. And the other, the other interesting about, thing about the Arctic Turn is that because of that journey, it actually gets to see more daylight than any other animal on Earth, because it's always, always in daylight pretty much when it takes that long journey. I'm gonna mention a, a winter migrant now. Um, these I imagine will be on their way back east and north. This is a Buick swan. It's one of two species of swan that stay with us over the winter. Species means types, different types of birds, so different species. They look a little bit like the mute swan that you see all year round, but you can see here they've got a yellow beak, yellow and black beak, and they're slightly smaller. Now, hopefully I'm gonna to point to the right places on the map here, but roughly over here, I think we've got Russia. Um, so in autumn, uh, thousands of these birds, these Buick swans, gather in a bay just north of Moscow to feed and build up their fat reserves. They're then gonna work their way down through Europe all the way to Western Europe and the UK, stopping off where they can to eat. 
And the swans that overwinter here move on through the Netherlands and Belgium and then cross the channel to get onto our shores. They're beautiful birds. Bird number three is a, a bird that I've actually had in the garden, which was quite incredible to see. This is a, a brambling, I'll take it a little bit closer so you can see. Um, it's very similar to a chaffinch, which is a bird that we see here quite regularly. In fact, they will often spend the winter flocking together with them. They eat the same kind of food, uh, seeds and nuts, in particular beech mast. Um, one winter, this is the incredible fact about Bramley, is they gather in huge numbers and one winter between 1951 and 52, um, I think around 70 million of them descended on the forest of Switzerland. I'm just going to have to turn quickly through a map to see where Switzerland is. Uh, sort of middle of Europe there. So large, large numbers. And I think last winter uh, a large flock was reported as well. So that's the Bramley. It's a very colourful little bird and, and really nice one to see during the winter. Then I've got two more winter visitors here. Um, these are the Brent geese. Um, there are two different varieties of Brent geese. It's, it's the same species, but just a, a, a kind of a different race, different variety. There's a light bellied uh, Brent goose, which is got a light colored tummy here. And they nest in the far north of Canada. So going over this side and re right in the far north. And in July, when they would be raising their chicks, they'd have 24 hours of daylight. That's plenty of time for their goslings, the, the name that we give young geese to grow very quickly. But in winter, uh, up in Canada, in the far north, everything's frozen over, so they need to travel south, uh, stopping off in Iceland, over here, uh, on their way to Strangford Lock in Ireland. And you'll also see dark bellied brink geese, so you can see the difference here. This one has a, a slightly darker tummy. Um, and these come from the other side, these come from the Russian Arctic, uh, over here. And uh, when I see them in the UK, because we see them down the, the eastern side of, side of the UK, I imagine the places they've come from. And, and this is the extraordinary thing, I think, about migratory birds. They, they could be uh, walking in a mudflat or a marshland somewhere around the coast of the UK in winter, in chilly weather. But perhaps just a few months ago, even a few weeks ago, they would have been in the frozen far north huge flat open landscapes with prowling polar bears and arctic foxes just imagine the things these birds see on their journeys it's incredible to think about there's another fact i, I almost forgot about the uh, dark bellied brent goose now this this is a particularly interesting one because they they fly they have a long journey but they're also quite long lived so to get here they travel around 6000 kilometers that is 3728 miles and during its lifetime, uh, it's been calculated that a dark bellied Brent goose from this region, from the, from the east, from, from Russia, might fly the equivalent of 2.6 times around the planet. That's an incredible journey for a bird to make. Now, from very, one very large bird to um, a smaller one. And again, I've tried to get some of these smaller birds. So they are, they are life size. The gold crest uh, along with the fire crest is the smallest bird you will see in the wild in the UK. It's so tiny. Um, I've got a little prop here to show me, to show you. Uh, it weighs 5.5 grams, which is about the same as a 20 pp. So if you've got a 20 pp, fill that in your hand. That is the weight of this tiny, tiny bird. And you can see them here all year round if you look in the right places. They like uh, conifers, which are Christmas tree type trees. And in winter, many of them arrive, again, trying to pinpoint on the map for you here, from Scandinavia up here. Um, and they will usually arrive around the same time as a slightly larger bird, which is called the woodcock. And it was thought uh, that they hitched a ride on the woodcock's back because no one could imagine that a bird this tiny, this tiny, could actually fly that distance. So they became, became known as woodcock pilots. And of course, we know now that they don't, they somehow manage that incredible journey on their own, just fueled by a few tiny insects that they would eat before they set off. Now, I'm gonna move on now to some birds that hopefully you'll be seeing very, very soon. This is a house martin. Uh, it's a bird that will be arriving this spring from Southern and Western Africa, uh, and coming up to us in the UK. You might even be lucky enough to have one nesting on your house. They make an impressive domed nest made out of mud. And actually, if we have a, a rather dry summer, you can help them up by watering a patch of mud in your garden so the birds can swoop down and scoop that mud up in their beaks to make their lovely little nest. And like most of our summer visitors, they eat insects. And if we get, um, by contrast, a, a very wet, cold period, if they come back too early perhaps and start their chicks off too early in the year, 
they have a clever little trick. Now, they have to catch insects. There's no other food that they can get flying around in the sky to feed their chicks. But what their chicks can do is if it's really cold and really damp, they go into something called torpor, which is like hibernation. They switch off. They literally switch off for a few days until the weather warms up and their mum and dad can come back and bring in some food for them. Now, I'm going next to one of the best known of the migrants. And um, we've had these over our garden already this year, which is very exciting. This is the swallow. Uh, they say one swallow doesn't make a summer. And there are various other phrases about swallows, actually. Um, one phrase is that you can use them to predict the weather slightly. Um, and that is when swallows fly high, it'll be dry. And that's basically because, again, it's an insect eating bird, flies through the sky, catching insects with its beak. And if there's um, air pressure, the clouds are pushed down, the insects are pushed down closer to the ground, the swallows will fly lower. And you can usually tell it means it's about to rain. Now, their journey is remarkable as well. I'm just going to pop it on the map here. So here we are in the UK. Now, this bird flies all the way down to South Africa. Um, so that's a round trip. So there and back of 20,000 kilometres, 12,400 miles a year. Swallows are responding to our changing climate, the fact that the world is getting warmer, and they arrive back in the UK now 15 days earlier than they would have done in the 1960s. And they also nest 11 days earlier as well. So they've got to hope that there are enough insects for them when they get back. Slightly different type of bird now, and you might not see this unless you're in a very particular part of the UK. And, and by that, I'm in some of the really northern islands of Scotland. It nests in Iceland as well. So you might see them. I've seen them right up here at the top in Iceland. It doesn't stick to the flyway. It doesn't really stick to any of the rules. This is the red necked phalarope. Lovely little bird. It's a wading bird, and if you know anything about wading birds in the UK, they're the kind of birds you see on the shoreline. They often have quite long legs. They walk around on the mud when the tide goes out, and they typically peck around, probing in the mud for food. The rainnet phalaro refuses to do this. It has uh, slightly lobed feet. That's a bit like a cross between a normal foot and a duck's foot, and that means they can paddle around in the water a bit like a coot or a duck, and they'll peck around in the water trying to find food that way. The other unusual thing, second, second of two really unusual things about the red neck phalarope is that it is the female that is more brightly coloured. Normally it is the male in most birds. And this is the female who will um, leave, <laughs> she'll, she'll go away and the male will be left to bring up the babies. That's quite unusual in British birds. There's only one other, I think, that does that. And the third amazing fact about the phalarope is this, to do with its migration. So imagine these birds are up here. They're up here in the northern islands of Scotland and up in Iceland. And then in the winter, we wondered where they went. They didn't go to Africa. So a few years ago, scientists put a tiny tracker on some of the phalaropes nesting on Fetla in Shetland to find out where they went in the winter. And the following year, when the birds returned, they were able to collect that tag, and put it into the computer and see what route the birds followed. And we we'll gonna have to turn and look at the map for this one. So excuse me one second. From Shetland, this tiny little bird had flown through Iceland and Greenland up here. Quite a journey to begin with, but then down the eastern side of the USA, down here, across Mexico, and all the way down to the coast of Ecuador and Peru. That's over here. It's crossed, okay, it's crossed the Atlantic and it's crossed the continent. Uh, and then obviously had to make that return journey for the spring a very long migration. Moving now to a bird that I hope you will see this summer. This is the swift. It's one of my favourite migratory birds. In fact, I'm going to say this is my favourite, just answering John's question there in the live chat. Uh, again, I've tried to do this roughly life size. These are extraordinary birds. They are unlike anything else that we have here. They do everything on the wing. They eat, they sleep, they mate, they drink and they bathe, everything. Their entire lives are on the wing. In fact, when a young swift leaves its nest, flies out of that hole for the first time, it may not land again. It may not touch solid ground or solid wall or anything again for another two or three years. That's an entire lifetime for many birds on the wing. A young swift will leave their nest and it will probably fly around, hunt for food and then head off to Africa. 
They only spend around 12 weeks here. They will arrive in May. Um, there's a, a wonderful website, actually. Lots of people in the UK are really inspired by these birds. There are lots of groups, wonderful uh, voluntary groups set up to look after them. And um, there's a website called Action for Swiss, which actually has a, a countdown on its homepage uh, until their expected arrival date, which is around the 7th of May. One swift, which was tracked by um, the BTO, British Trust for Ornithology and the RSPB, um, took this long journey, so UK, all the way down to Africa. And that's a journey of 9,020 kilometres. And what's particularly interesting about that journey is that it crossed through 25 different countries, 25 countries. And they are the best tenants you can have, the best neighbours on the side of your house. As I said, they're only here for around 12 weeks a year. They eat biting insects. They might nibble on you when you're in the garden. They make no mess. And they're fairly quiet, except when they fly away from the nest and you'll hear little parties of them screaming as they hunt for insects. They are truly amazing creatures. Do look out for swift this year. And, and even if we're inside, you can look out of your window and you will see them soaring through the skies. I've got two more birds to go. So I'll very quickly whiz through a couple more of my favourites. This is the waxwing, and it is perhaps my favourite bird, my absolute favourite bird. I shouldn't have favourites, actually. Um, this is a beautiful, exotic-looking winter visitor. And the amazing thing is you never know when they're going to turn up in large numbers. Some winter we don't see many at all. Some winters we get thousands of them. And those are known as eruptions. And they will fly here from up here, far north and east of Europe, down through Europe, and hopefully some coming to the UK. Lots of cool things about waxwings. They have a call that sounds like sleigh bells. Very Christmassy. Uh, they get slightly drunk on berries. If the berries are a bit fermented, they, they eat red berries. You can often see them, in fact, in supermarket car parks where they have those red berry trees. And although we tend not to see it here, when they go back to their nesting grounds in the far north, they do a lovely little thing. And luckily, I've got two waxwings here to demonstrate, but no berry. The male will pass a berry to the female. She'll pass it back, back and forth several times. And we think that's to help their, their bond, strengthen their bond as they're planning to nest and raise their young. Final birds, because they're running out of time rapidly here. This is a willow warbler, and they are already back in the UK. Its song is a wonderful cascade of descending notes that Lucy Hodson, in her Earth Live lesson, said was a little bit like a waterfall sound. They sing high up in a tree and arrives, as I say, around now in April, is with us until September, when it will fly back down all the way down to Southern Africa. And again, amazing that a bird this tiny actually makes that journey. So quick questions from the live chat. So hi, Mike Dixon. How do birds know where they're going? This is a really interesting one. I've been reading a book called Bird Sense by uh, Professor Tim Burkhead. And in it, he explains that what we know about where how birds find their way now is something to do with the magnetic field of the Earth. And we can't see it. We can't sense it. We know that if we use a compass to find out which way is north, that uh, uses the magnetic field of the Earth. But it's thought now that birds have proteins inside their eyes. And you've got to remember that animals see the world very differently to how we do. Birds have actual proteins inside their eyes that help them see the magnetic field and work out where they are and where they're going. It's worth remembering for a, uh, a migratory bird that it doesn't really know many other locations. It knows the place it nests. It knows the place it goes to. So if it's disturbed, if it can't nest in the same place or can't spend the winter in the same place, it's going to get super confused. And um, so that's why it's really important to look after those special places where these migratory birds nest and where they need to spend the winter. So I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I mentioned that it's, it's a tough life being a, a, a migrant. They have a really, really long way to go um, and lots of threats and dangers upon the way, uh, climate change being one of them. So we must do all we can to uh, look after these, these very special creatures. Um, luckily, there are some amazing nature charities out there doing their bit. Now, I've got one minute left. I'm just going to see if there's any, any more questions. So, Mike, I hope I've answered yours. And Karoy, hi from India. Hello. Hello to India. Uh, favourite migratory bird. I uh, mentioned the swift. Um, are birds having to change the migration routes with climate change? That's a really good question, Nick. Um, we don't know is the answer yet. Um, science will continue tracking the birds, seeing when they're arriving. Um, it has been noted, I suppose, um, anecdotally, people have spotted that things are slightly different, but I expect we are going to see a bit of a shift 
as the climate changes and those different areas are available for them to find their food and places to nest. Now, I'm going to quickly round up very, very quick because I know we're running out of time with a line from one of my favourite books about bird migration. It's by Michael McCarthy. And it's called Say Goodbye to the Cookie. And he says, if we could see it as a whole, if they all arrived in one single day, in one single flock, and they came in the days of the night, we would be truly amazed. 16 million birds coming to the UK. How other with, than with wonder could we view the sight of 16 million swallows, swifts, martins, warblers, wagtails, wheatears, cuckoos, chats, nightingales, nightjars, thrushes, hippets and flycatchers pouring into Britain from sub-Saharan Africa. They would cover the sky from horizon to horizon. It would be the greatest of all natural spectacles. Work would stop. People would gather to watch it. That night, it would lead the television news. It would dominate the papers. This nation would celebrate, not only for the giant, scarcely credible journey that I've been talking about today, but the reason which moves us even more, that for many of them, when they arrive, it means it's spring and we have a lot to look forward to. Um, one final question. Joseph, how's a swift sweet sleep? I think like a lot of birds, they kind of shut one eye, half of the brain switches off and they just soar around. They just keep floating around the sky. They are amazing. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. You can follow me on Twitter, J underscore underscore M-E or on Instagram at Jamie Wyver. Thank you all very much for watching and goodbye.